That's the downfall to this COVID thing is the doors stay open and the bugs come in. Oh, it's all right. I trusted the Lord. I was supposed to eat. Well, if you did eat it, we just do a little extra protein. No big deal, right? But yeah, flies are flies. They will live 24 hours with an adult. But let's go ahead and do something a little bit different today, just because I feel we need to, and I'm trying to figure it out, and someone said, why don't you do it this way, so we're going to do it this way. I like it. And we'll go ahead and stand up, stretch out just a little bit. Now, I want to look around and see someone you want to say hi to, and I want to say hi to if you cross the room. And if you just want to say hi to everybody, go ahead and say hi to everybody, we won't care. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. I didn't hear that many hellos, but that's all right. I heard a lot of laughter and saw a lot of waves. We'll take it. Now, I have to, have to say something. She's going to shoot me later, but yesterday we had our first contemporary service here at church, and we, we, we sang a song called Raise a Hallelujah. So I'm sitting beside Michelle, and we're singing Raise a Hallelujah, and she starts laughing. And I couldn't figure out why is she laughing. And she kept on going, she just kept on. And we got home a few weeks later, and she goes, all I heard is that every time we said Raise a Hallelujah, she was having respect to God, Jesus was looking on, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Honey! I love you, I had to bring it up, because it just still makes my, makes my day all the time. So you never know, God might actually do that sometime. You might be singing, you might just say, Holler, how you doing? It's possible. That's the best idea I got. And there's no Medea's movies in our, our series today, or, or this month, but that's all right. We're, we're going to be taking a look at, at another child movie, and I know you guys love when I show cartoons, or at least I do. They're my favorite. I love cartoons. They, they seem to, to, to grasp the, the innocence of childhood, at the same time, bringing out a lot of different meaning for adults to look into. Before we, we get into the story of the Racket Ralph, I have a few questions I want you guys to kind of ponder, things to, to think about. And the first question is, have you ever felt like you didn't belong? Have you ever felt like you didn't belong? No matter what you do, you just don't fit into the group. Plain and simple, you just don't belong. Tough thing to think about sometimes because we like to belong. We like to have a place that, that we fit into. But today in our movie that we're going to for a short amount of time, we, we, we have two main characters that felt just that way. They felt like they did not belong. And as they went on a journey to find a place for belonging, they, they just kind of reveal some things that, that we need to take into consideration, not only for ourselves, but for other people around us. And it actually all starts with two totally different beginnings, because both characters have different starts. So the movie starts out with the, the wonderful narration of wreck and Ralph talking about, well, there's my, my, my game. Then there's a lot of arcade games go through. In case you haven't known or don't know, wreck and Ralph is about a video game, arcade game character that is known as Racket Ralph, who plays in the game Fix-It Felix Jr. Racket Ralph's job in the, in the game is to destroy the condo that the Inlanders live in, and Fix-It Felix comes around and he fixes it up. Of course, if you're the person playing the arcade game, you're playing Fix-It Felix, you get points for fixing stuff, and eventually you get rewarded with a medal at the top once you win. And at the end of the, of the game session, that the Inlanders gather together, they gather Ralph up and they throw him off the building into the mud. And as the story progresses and you start to see where, where Ralph is at, you can see that the inlanders get together all the time when the arcade closes and they have a party and they celebrate and they have a great time and, and they enjoy the company of the fix it Felix, but here's Ralph left out. They get to sleep in their comfy little condos while he has to sleep literally in the garbage pile of all the bricks that he knocked off the building. And I know that doesn't sound like much, but, but it's part of Ralph's story. But he started to wonder, why is it that I don't fit in? This is my game, too. Why can't I be a part of it? 
And he goes to this, this little support group called Bad and Um. It's for bad guys in your movies. It's funny, kind of. Especially when you know, if you're my age, you look around and you see all the bad characters that you used to love beating up on the video games. And he starts to open his heart about that story and how he just wants to find something where he can fit in and he can belong and, and he can be a part of it. Why can't the bad guys get the medal? Why can't the bad guys have the good story? So he goes on to that, that aspect of things, and one day they're, they're out, they're celebrating, they're having a good time, and they're, they're celebrating the 30th anniversary of Fix, Fix It Felix Jr. 30 years the video game has been around, almost as long as Pac-Man. Probably actually a little bit less than that. And, and, and he, he sees the party taking place in the upper penthouse of, of the condo building, and, and he's sitting in the garbage, thinking, why? Why am I not a part of this? I'm part of this game. It, it's my 30th anniversary, too. So he decides to go up to, to break in and enjoy the party with them. All while the Inlanders are not very happy, they're scared, and they look at Felix and say, hey, you got to take care of him. He can't be here. Well, fix it, Felix likes to fix things, so he decides, oh, he can't do any harm. He just wants a piece of cake. Let's get him some cake and he'll go. As it progresses on, Ralph crashes the party. He gets to go in and starts breaking stuff like Ralph does. He's wrecking Ralph. He, he gets to the cake and notices that they, they took all these details of the cake, and each little room is that character's favorite flavor. And, and then there's Ralph walking the building with no one else around him in the mug. And uh, the little heated thing between him and another inlander goes on about why isn't he on top of the roof when he doesn't belong on top of the roof. It goes back and forth, back and forth. Because the inlanders don't appreciate who Ralph is. And that's kind of his story. That sets on the moon. And there's, there's a comment that was made that uh, when you, Ralph, when you can, can win a medal, because bad guys never win a medal, but then, then we'll put you on top of the cake with us. But only then. So Ralph left the party and had that in his mind, and that's what he set out to do, which is where the story kind of comes into play. Um, he, he goes on and he goes into a, a bar. Cappers. Oh, you guys ever play Cappers? No, okay. One person has. I have not. I didn't know it, so I had to look it up. And he talks to them about where can a bad guy get a medal? And no one can figure it out. And all of a sudden, a new game comes in, and the guy's kind of losing it over bugs and Ralph's like, I can do that. So he kind of beats him up, puts him in the closet, takes his, his uniform, goes into the game. And Ralph goes to the game, interferes with the program a little bit, but doesn't get killed, because if you get killed outside of your game, then you're really dead. And as the game resets, Ralph continues on to the top of the tower to claim the medal. He gets the medal, and as always, Ralph messes things up. He steps on one of the little eggs, hatches a bug, and the bug trips him up, he gets in a rocket, he gets shipped out of that game, flies around in a little lodge thing, and then on into a game called Sugar Rush. And Sugar Rush is where we meet another couple characters. Which, I don't want to ruin the whole movie for you guys, but it's going to get ruined anyway, because I talk about the whole movie throughout the rest of the sermon. And that brings us into our second character, Penelope. Princess Penelope, as we find out at the end. But known for the beginning when Ralph meets her as just simply Penelope the Glitch. You see, her story takes place with another video game character named Turbo, whose game got canceled, and he decided he was going to reprogram another one so he could still have a life. And he reprogrammed Sugar Rush, took Princess Penelope out. She was still in, so she became a glitch. She wasn't supposed to be there according to the new programming. And Long story short, she just simply didn't belong. She forgot who she was. She forgot what her skills were. She forgot what she was supposed to be able to do. And at one point here, we, we see that, that Penelope and Ralph's stories just simply collide. You've got the one who doesn't belong with the Inlanders and Felix, and the one that was reprogrammed and made not to belong, merging together. Two people, same story, different outcomes, as we'll find out. But as it, as it merges together, this is where we begin with our clip today. So if Dalton's paying attention, and I'm sure he is, and we don't get it too complicated, let's pick up Ralph and Penelope as they merge together. 
So the question becomes, what can we learn from, from Penelope? What can we learn from Ralph? We're going to focus most of our time that we have left on Penelope because she's the one that demonstrates the most of what we can learn. Penelope makes a statement that speaks volumes for us as Christians. She says, racing is in my coat. She says that even though she didn't know how to start a car, even though she didn't know how to drive a car, she just knew that racing was in her code and it's something that she needed to do. It's who she is. We, too, have a code. A code that pulls for us to yearn for something that we might not know. Over in Psalm chapter 84, verses 1 through 4. David describes this journey. You can turn there, you can write it down. We tried to, to wrap it up. We're running a little short on our technical time. And he, he describes it this way. He says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out to the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young and placed near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Did you catch how David describes the code? My heart and my soul, my, my soul yearns for the courts of God. My heart and my flesh, they cry out to the living God. We are built with a code, with a program that says we must be in the presence of God. Everything we do revolves around that aspect of things. We stop and we enjoy sunsets and sunrises. We stop and watch the glory of a waterfall and the sound that it makes. We, we see the beautiful mountain ranges and we take them in. Why? Because they all give us a glimpse of the courts of God. A place that we want to be. A place that we find fulfillment. A place where we find our belonging. We yearn for something more, something greater, because we were made for far more than we can ever imagine. It is in our code, our code to finish the race, even if we don't really know how we are to run it. And that stands true for many of us here today. We have started a race, we have devoted our lives and followed after Christ, but yet we stand here after we get out of the water and we look outside the door and we say, I don't know where we're going to go. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know I have to do it. There's something God is pulling me to do. The biggest thing we need to realize is that is there because God has said, you are mine. You belong with me. You will never be content until you are in my court. All we need to know when it comes to starting that, that race is that it's in our code. The race is there. The one that, that Paul tells us we must continue to run the race, continue to finish it, work hard until it is there. The finish line stands right in the throne room of God, the court of God. And when we pursue that which we yearn for, the greatest thing ever happens. Because when we pursue that what we yearn for, we pursue being in the presence of God, Satan's deception starts to lose its power. Satan loves to pull us down. Satan loves to fill our minds with, with things like, like, you're not good enough. Like, you're not the Christian you think you are. You don't pray enough. You don't read your Bible enough. You don't know how to talk to people about God. Satan loves putting those things in our heads. Why? Because he knows we'll believe them. And then we'll start to struggle. And then we'll stand right here before the God's altar and say, I just can't do it. Sorry, God, I just can't. But Satan wants it that way. So when we put him aside and we start pursuing God with everything we have, his deception starts to fall. Because that yearning, that code, it pushes us to pursue. It pushes us to race. Because we know that there is something more that we are not seeing. Penelope was that way. She knew there was something she had to do. 
Something that she couldn't see, something she couldn't understand. Because Turbo, when he reprogrammed it, took her memories. She had no clue that she was really Princess Penelope. She had no clue that she was supposed to be the top racer. She is the one that's supposed to rule the people and do so fairly. The Satan, a.k.a. Turbo, or King Candy, didn't want her to know that. In fact, he thought he had done away with her completely, and Satan says the same thing to us. He thinks he's done away with us completely because we stumble and we fall and we might sin here, we might sin there. So he thinks, oh, I've got it, I'm going. And when we pursue what God has for us, things change. You'll flip your Bibles over to James chapter 4. James gives us a very insightful way that we can pursue God. How is that to happen? It, it, it's amazing how if we just look closely at verses that we've read time and time again, and they start breaking it down, we get a step-by-step a -step action plan, if you will. Starting with verse 7 of James chapter 4, James writes, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Did you catch all those steps? Did you hear it? I know you know that verse and that passage. We talk about it all the time. We love, especially that first part. Resist the devil, and he will flee. There's more to it than just resist it. The first step we have is that we have to submit to God. We have to do his work. We have to do his will. We can't just stand and say, yep, I, I was baptized, and I'm ready, and I just stand here. That's not doing his work. That's not following his command. Because if you just stand there, coming out of the water, then you're doing nothing. And God's commands for us have always been action words, never just sit there and do nothing. It's always been go and make, go and love, go and show, go and teach. So we must submit to God, and then we can resist the devil, and he will flee. But he goes on, he says, come near to God. Talk to God. Build that relationship with him. Start making that one-on-one -on -one time with him. Don't just put it off a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the evening. Invest your day around him. Make it to where everything you do is about God and wanting to know more about him. Be in your Bibles more. Do whatever it takes for you to get to know who he is. More than just the God that sent his son to die for you. Because he's so much more than that. Then he says, wash your hands and purify your, purify your hearts. Wash your sins away. For some of us, it might be the first step of coming forth and Confessing Christ before man, repenting of our sins, and being baptized and forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit for the first time ever. Wash your sins away. And for some of us, we've already done that. We've already been baptized. So what else do we need to do? I've gotten my hands dirty again, just like the priests in the Old Testament. And every time they came to the altar, they had to wash their hands and their feet so that they could be made clean before the Lord. So how do we do that? Ask God for forgiveness. Because He's got enough grace and mercy to go around that if you ask, He will forgive you. But then He goes on and says, Why don't you go ahead and grieve, wail, and mourn? Now, why in the world would God want His children to grieve and wail and mourn? Why? Because when we grieve and we wail and we mourn, it shows that we really do mean what we're saying. When we grieve and wail, it means, yes, we are sorry for the wrongdoing we've done. It is an act of showing repentance. Not just to go through the motions, but to really mean it, because it's sticking you to your heart that you have done wrong against God. So you grieve, you wail, and you mourn because you know you've wronged the one person that you should never have wronged. So you show that you're sorry and you're willing to change. For when we hit rock bottom, that's when God does the best work. Then he says, humble yourself before the Lord. Hit the rock bottom. Go on and say, God, I can't do it. 
but I know that you can, and if you help, I can do things. With your help, God, I can do exactly what you've called me to do. With your help, God, I can go out and I can reach my neighbors. With your help, God, I can go and I can reach my family. With your help, God, I can go demonstrate love to the ones that no one else loves. With your help, God, I can do anything. For with God, all things are possible. And we are humble enough to ask him for help. He will do one very important thing. He will lift you up. And what is that? God's going to lift me up. God's going to raise me up off the floor. And he's going to pat me on the butt and say, get going. That's hard. But it also means he's going to say, you're my son. You're my daughter. You're doing what I need you to do, and I'm proud of you. And he'll exalt you amongst the nations. He'll exalt you amongst your brothers and your sisters because he knows that you finally realize who you really are. Penelope did the same thing. She went on, she learned to race because it was in her code, and she raced the race that she needed to race despite everything that came at her. And she won the race. And when she won, won that race, when she crossed that finish line, the entire code that Turbo or King Candy reset and redid was completely redone back to the original. Back to the way it was meant to be. And the glitch Penelope became Princess Penelope once again. And she learned that she was the rightful ruler of Sugar Rush, Sugar, yeah, sugar Rush, or Sugar Crush. There's too many sugars in and she went on to, to rule like she was supposed to. And it's the same with you. When you follow after God and you pursue him with all your heart and soul, your code gets reset. All the lies that Satan has told you, you find out aren't true. You find out your true identity. Because you find that because you are a child of God, you are a king and you are a queen of his kingdom. You are worth more than what Satan ever gave you credit for. So what about Ralph? What did Ralph learn? What did Ralph teach us? Because in the end, Ralph got what he wanted. When Ralph left to pursue the medal, fix it, Felix Jr. got shut down. Because there's no way the game could go on. The Inlanders and Felix found respect for him. They found respect for the role that Ralph had to play in their game. And found out that without him, there'd be no fix of Felix. Without him, their game would be unplugged and taken away. So he found purpose within the game. But ultimately what Ralph found was Ralph found his place. Found where he belonged. Where? Yeah, he belonged in Big Felix Jr. Tearing up the building so that the players could have fun and the elders could have a place to stay. But he found his belonging beside the mountain, helping her save her games, her people, and formed a friendship that would last and last and last. We not only need to pursue the yearning of our hearts, but we also need to learn that every single person around us, not just in this building, but around the world, has a yearning for God as well. It's written in their code. They're looking, trying to figure it out. How do I get there? How is it possible? And what they need, they need to wreck it out. They need a record route to come in and break apart the glitches of Satan's lies, the deception that he puts out, so they can see what God desires, what God wants. And everyone, no matter how big or how small, no matter how young or how old, no matter what their skin color is or, or what their genetic makeup is, they need to belong. And that is why God sent his son, so that all may belong in the kingdom of God. And not just the one he is preparing for us. We know that ultimately that is our finish line. But the only belong in the kingdom of God that is here, now, 
boom, green, green cheek. And it's our job to make sure that everyone feels like they belong, that everyone is a part of the family, that everyone understands that they are a king and they are a queen, and we are all part of royalty because we all serve the one true king. For we all belong to Jesus, and therefore we all are to be loved and valued by God's church now. We are in this together for the journey. And that journey is a long journey. That journey is a tiresome journey. And we need each other to make it through. We need it to be where everyone is together, encouraging and uplifting and encouraging each other to continue pursuing the code written within us. The yearning to be in God's heart. For that one another, we fail. So what does Record Ralph teach us? Record Ralph teaches us that we have to follow what God has laid before us. To lay aside the lies of Satan. And allow each and every person around us to belong to God. Because if we deny someone the right to belong, we deny them the right to be. And I'm sorry to say that's not our job. It's not our place. The record route teaches us let's go out and do whatever it takes to right the wrongs that Satan has placed in his way. We pray. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for the moments we've had today to not only sing your, your praises, but to, to look into your word. And, and not only that, but to see how your word can relate with the things around us. Lord, right now, we, we, we pray that deceptions will be lifted. Not just deceptions that, that we might believe or, or we might face, but deceptions around the world. Deceptions of, of, of Satan's that are, are affecting people where they're not willing to come after you, not willing to follow after you. We ask, Lord, that you allow someone to enter into people's lives and to be that record route to destroy them, to remove them so they can see you and get to know who you are. We, we pray, Lord, for unity and belonging, not only within your body of believers here at Antioch, but amongst the entire world. For we know that if we can bring people to you, that they will find that that unity exists. If we can bring people to you, then we can find that not only is there unity, but they also have a place that they can call home. A place where they can feel like they are loved, and they are valued, and they are honored, as they are. Lord, we, we pray for compassion. So that we can go out and we can fill this, this body of Antioch up, and we can fill the rest of the world with people that will be falling in love with you, and therefore build your kingdom. So that when that day happens, and we are at our finish line, there in your courts, we can look around and see so many people filling this place, all the same purpose of worshiping you. And Lord, we, we pray that with that compassion that we have, that it will not just be something that we, we feel, we feel, but it will be something that we are willing to do. That we'll take that compassion to the streets, to our neighbors, to our family, to our workplaces, and that we will go and that we'll wreck Satan's deceptions around the world and people will be able to see you through us. And Lord, we ask you to allow us to, to Continue on this journey steadfastly, with strength, with courage, with knowledge and wisdom, so that everywhere we go, we take the most opportunities that we have and show your love, your grace, and your mercy, which are all demonstrated through your Son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. For some of us here, we, we need to make a decision to follow after Christ. We're going to stand and sing our invitation here in a second. If that is you and you need to accept him for the first time, we ask that you come forward and do so. There's no time like now to say I'm ready. And to jump on that, that racetrack and, and get going. For others of us, we were here and we know that, that we have screwed up. We've lost sight of what our true passion is. We've lost sight of the things that we're supposed to be pursuing. And we're stuck at the altar going, I don't know what to do. And it's time for God to step in again because you're going to pursue him. You're going to humble yourself before him and allow him to change you into the person he wants you to be. If that is you, we ask and we stand and sing that you just go ahead and, 
and either come forward and ask for prayer for, for you to be rejuvenated and, and rededicated or, or to take the time now when we stand here and pray to God that he will get you back to the path you're supposed to be. The decisions that need to be made and you need now, we just ask that you make an understanding and an invitation. Thank <laughs> you.